Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the New Construction Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Anya Chrysanthan, and I am excited to introduce our guest for today. He is a returning guest. Uh, he uh, did a quick um, overview of IBS on one of the previous shows, Spencer Powell with Builder Funnel. Welcome to the show, Spence. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me back. And yeah, I'm excited for our conversation today. Yes, so we'll get you all to myself now and have to share uh, <laughs> sure. with, the, uh, with the others. So I figured um, I wanted to dive more into what you do, what your company does. So if you don't mind kicking things off by giving us, again, a quick overview for um, your journey into this crazy world of home building and um, how, you know, how did you um, end up with what you do now and what is it that you guys do for the builders? Yeah, so uh, our company backstory it kind of, I guess, merges a couple of different worlds. I've got uh, two families of entrepreneurs on one side of my family. They've been in the home building business for uh, over 100 years out in the Seattle area. Um, so like my great-great-grandfather, grandfather, my dad, my uncles all kind of went through that business. Um, and then on the other side, my other grandfather had a direct mail marketing business. Um, and my dad moved our family from Seattle to Colorado Springs and bought that business. And I never thought I would get involved in that business. It was direct mail. It didn't sound super interesting to me. <laughs> uh, so uh, I kind of went the digital route when I got out of school and started getting into, you know, Facebook business pages when those were like the hot new thing. And, uh, you know, everyone was creating those and trying to figure out social media. And then we... Um, stumbled across a, you know, a software partner that said, hey, you know, there's kind of more than just social media. There's all these components like SEO and content, lead conversion. And so it was like, really, it's called inbound marketing, which is this process of pulling people into you that are already looking for what you have to offer versus kind of traditional push marketing where you're just, you know, billboards, TV, radio, where you're just shoving kind of your message out into the world. And so said, okay, like this makes sense. The way people shop and buy is different. You know, they're Googling stuff, they're going online. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of merged the two worlds. We said, okay, let's figure out this whole inbound marketing thing. And we know building and we've got that family background. So let's start doing that for that business. And um, that building business, they actually had a remodeling division that they um, had built and they needed to scale that up when kind of the recession hit. So we helped them go from about two to five million over the next few years wow. said hey I think we can help some other people do this you know and not uh, bad during recession too right uh, right yeah um, <laughs> it was good and so we were we were still figuring a lot of things out and I mean we still are that everything changes so fast but we said okay we like the methodology makes sense and so um, that was really kind of the foundings of builder funnel before it was builder funnel it was just a division of this direct mail company and you know, fast forward to today, we um, sold off the direct mail side of the business. And now all we do is, you know, digital marketing, inbound marketing for, for builders. That's awesome. So since you guys sold off the, the direct uh, mail piece, you may be biased, but is that dead for um, home, home building industry? Like, is that something you would recommend people still use or just forget mailings altogether? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. You know, I don't think it's completely dead. And the interesting thing is everything seems to move in like cycles and waves. And so what happened in the direct mail industry was all the touch mail basically went to digital. So like bills, statements, all that, it just went to email. So, so much of that industry was just gone. It went to email. And, uh, and really what's left today is more marketing mail. And there's less stuff in mailboxes today than there was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so I think with the right application, like you can still have that as a part of your mix. It's not gonna be your end all be all channel, you know, so to speak, but I think it still has a place because you can do so much targeting, you know, in terms of demographics, locations, you know, you can buy different lists or rent different lists. and so. Um, because it has that targeting component, I think it will always uh, have some place. I shouldn't say always, but I think it still has a place today. 
Yeah. And it's kind of like the idea of um, like a, almost like omnipresence, right? So that they're seeing your marketing piece in the mail. They're seeing your pop-up advertisement on the website. They're seeing, you know, other forms of you. So it's kind of like, okay, so you're attacking from so many different directions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a lot of channels and in marketing, they say, you know, you need so many touches or exposures to your brand for somebody to really, you know, recognize you. And so, yeah, if they get something in the mail and then they're like, oh yeah, I should check out that model. And then, you know, they go to the website first and they do some research and then they get another mailing or they get an email from you and then it's like, okay, yeah, I'll actually go in and, you know, talk to somebody now. So yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. And, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier this week and they said that, um, one of the things that builders struggle with is build like uh, brand recognition. I guess most builders think that their brand is really like what stands out to people, what people pay attention to, where if you talk to people who are shopping for homes, you know, after a day of going to X amount of models, they virtually have no idea like who, who was who and they can't tell one, one from the other. So that's, uh, that certainly is interesting with that. Um, but so you mentioned the new way of marketing. So you said inbound marketing instead of outbound marketing. Okay, so does that mean no ads? Like, so what does it mean inbound marketing? How does it yeah. work? Yeah, it's a great question. So inbound marketing basically takes this premise, which is the way people shop and buy is very different today. So, hey, if I'm looking for a new home, you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to go online and start doing research. So what you want to do is match up your marketing efforts to that way that they're shopping and buying, which is going online. So mm -hmm. that tends to be things like creating really good content that these people are looking for. So like, how long does it take to build? What types of you know, floor plans are there? What is the, you know, cost and, you know, what are the new trends and all these different things. I mean, there's boatloads of questions that people have when they're going to make a purchase like this. And so mm -hmm. if you're addressing those questions with content, so blog posts, website pages, videos, podcasts, those are all forms of content. Then you start to draw these people in because they're typing stuff into Google. They're on social media and they go, Oh yeah, I'm really interested in that. Or, Oh, I was wondering about that. And now suddenly they're on your website because you've drawn them in. So that's the high level of inbound marketing. Instead of pushing a message out, you know, so like an ad, you're mm -hmm. creating content that's attracting people and pulling them in and meeting them where they are. They're already researching and looking for it. Uh, it doesn't mean there isn't a role for outbound and, you know, ads and that sort of thing. Like we just talked about with direct mail, you can do lots of targeting. Um, there's certainly a case for building a brand through like TV, radio, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, but the whole premise of inbound is, hey, let's meet these people where they are in their research process. And if they're researching, hopefully they're actually in your target, you know, or at least looking for a home, you know, otherwise why would they be looking for this right. stuff? So how do we, I guess, um, you know, because um, some of the things you brought up is what people are searching for uh, when they're building a home. So like the length of time, et cetera. Um, so I guess how can we make it so that we're not drawing people from Pennsylvania who are looking to build in Colorado? Like what's the, I guess, is there, do we, do we put more Colorado words in or like how do we do it? Because obviously um, you can bring so many people to the website, but are they the people who are actually your customers? Yeah, it's a really good question. And that's definitely where like SEO starts to come into play or search engine optimization. And yeah, I mean, maybe if we're talking about the timeline to build, we might talk about like, how long does it actually take to build a house in Colorado Springs versus Atlanta? And maybe there's different lead times. Uh, maybe there's different like regulations. So permitting and all these things. Um, and a lot of it is going to be dependent on the community, the type of home, you know, so it triggers a list of other questions, but yeah, the more you can localize your content and make it more specific to your target, then mm -hmm. you can start to pull those people in. I will say that the digital game, like if you create a really great piece of content, 
-hmm. and you start attracting, like say you're in Atlanta and you start drawing in a lot of people in Atlanta, you're probably going to just get a lot of other people too. And that's where lead qualification comes into play and like using your website to qualify out people that aren't Mm -hmm. necessarily good buyers or good, uh, they aren't in your target market, but I would rather create a really good piece of content and get more of my target audience and more not in my target audience than not get anybody at all. And so you do have a little bit of that where you're having to like sort through, um, mm-hmm. but you can definitely use localized terms to, to help avoid that. But that's interesting how it's flipped because now you're saying I'm going to weed out people who are not my customers as opposed to I'm going to try to get people in. You know, so it's, it's almost like a different reverse, you know, reverse psych- psychology almost, right? Like we're going to attract um, all these people and then we're going to qualify them to see if they're actually our customers, if they're, if they're a good match for us. If not, then bye. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you, you're not helping that person or you can't help that person that's not a good fit. Um, but it doesn't mean they didn't still get value from your website. Um, mm-hmm. Did it hurt you? No, you know, not really. <laughs> Unless you're really getting to a point where you're having to spend so much time qualifying. But I think in that instance, if somebody types that question into Google, they find your blog and they go, oh, these guys are in Atlanta, I'm in Colorado. They're not going to reach out to you and start, you know, asking to come into a model and wasting somebody's time. They just went on your website and got some information. So, um, yeah, I'd rather open up that top of the funnel and get more people in there. And then the people that come down to the bottom, your bottom of the funnel is going to be wider, too, because you just got more people coming into the site. Mm hmm. I love that. That's, that's an interesting concept. So now I'm sure a lot of builders are doing this, hopefully. Um, hopefully. So now um, how do I compete against the, you know, the big guy with the huge marketing team who are cranking out a blog a day? Um, you know, are there any um, strategies for, say, if we're in the same market and we're competing for the same type of a customer? and maybe I'm a smaller builder with less of a budget, um, is there a trick to, like, what can I do in order to make myself stand out from this big guy putting mm-hmm. out essentially the same type of a content to attract them? Is, you know, it's almost like there's a bait I put out, like, you know, what kind of a bait somebody wants? Um, is there, you know, do I boost those posts? Do I use some kind of ads to to reach more people? Like what, what can I do to really compete against the, the bigger guy with a bigger marketing budget? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a big question. It's a really good one. And I think there's a few different layers. And I guess to start, I would say Google doesn't know the size of your company, which immediately out of the gates gives the small guy the upper hand, uh, in my opinion, because let's just say you've got you know, a regional or a national builder and they're playing in your space as a local builder, you know, so Denver or something like that. Um, Google doesn't necessarily know that that company should be ranking number one just because they have a bigger team and more, you know, budget. Um, So as the small guy, I would be focused on, I want to create the best piece of content on this topic. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have the most money to create the best piece of content. You can take a question, you know, that you get in the sales process, answer it fully, completely, add photos, maybe add even a video into that post, make it really long, really detailed. And if you look at your competition, even that regional guy or national guy that's in your space, a lot of these guys aren't creating really great, amazing pieces of content. And so you have a big window of opportunity, which is, hey, I'm going to come in, I'm going to create the best piece of content. And then suddenly what you'll find is that you have something really valuable to share on social media and that other people reshare because it actually is helpful. And so they like it, they comment on it, they reshare it. Google sees all those social signals, so it starts to bump you up. Um, Other bloggers and other websites see that post, Mm -hmm. they start to link to it. So now those links help that content move up even more. And so uh, I think that's one of the really cool things about inbound marketing is that Google doesn't know the size of company you are. They're just looking to get their 
searchers the best information the fastest. And so if you have the best information and you can show them that through like social signals and getting other websites to link to you, then your page is going to shoot up. Um, obviously from like a Google AdWords standpoint, uh, Facebook ads, like bigger builders can outspend you, but you can get those organic spots by just doing a really good job. All right, so let's talk a little bit about doing a good job. So okay. you mentioned the length of the post. Yes. So what can, say, say we're going to take a typical question that a lot of home buyers ask, and we're going to create a whole topic around it. And I love how you mentioned, you know, doing a blog post, doing a video, because you can do so much with just one piece of content, right? You can turn, it in, turn that same piece of content into a podcast, you can turn it into a video, you can transcribe it and use it as a blog post. So there's multi, multi levels of what you can do with it with just one thing. So totally. that's, that's really cool because that can save you a lot of time. And when you're thinking about coming up with new content over and over, you can just look at what you've done in the past, what was the success, and maybe just put it out in a different form. So... Um, are there any tips as far as what Google likes as far <laughs> as, you know, obviously you got to have a stellar content, right? That's the, that's the bottom line. But is there like a minimum number of words in a blog that Google needs in order to register it as a, you know, a, a, as a higher ranking versus somebody else? Um, you know, is there, if you use so many keywords or you're going to be penalized for that because you always hear kind of, you know, different sides of the story. So can you give us a little bit more on, let's talk about specifically blogs mm -hmm. um, because obviously with video and everything else, it's a little bit of a different story. Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's also a complex one. I think there's a bunch of articles out there that say there's about 200 ranking factors that Google <laughs> looks at, you know, to, to rank a post. And so obviously every time we write a blog, we can't look at all 200. It's just not very efficient use of our time, but there are a lot of, I guess, key best practices that you can, um, you know, put into play when you create every post. And so, yeah, you asked about length and I think um, it's interesting the, you used to be able to just churn out like 200, 300 word blog posts and you mm -hmm. could create like, I'm just going to write one a day or, you know, several a week uh, and just crank these things out. And it was all quantity. Mm -hmm. And it's really made this pendulum shift to quality content. Um, I still feel like quantity benefits you, but only if it's at least meeting that quality threshold and it's good okay. content. Um, I just saw a stat the other day that said that typical average ranking positions in Google for, you know, blog posts and that sort of thing, um, like that average number one search is well over or not well over, but slightly over a thousand words long. Wow, so, okay. um, I generally as like a minimum shoot for your 500 to 700 words is like, okay, that's enough to cover this topic, give some mm -hmm. good information. Um, but just note that a lot of those number one ranking positions are a thousand words, 1500 words, maybe even more. It just depends on what the topic was and, uh, and also what other types of content are out there on that same topic that you're competing with. And then I think as you like break that down, you go, okay, we talked about timeline, you know, how do I talk about timeline for a thousand words? You know, I would maybe consider looking at process and so, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to cover the process of building a home and I'm going to break it out into phases. So I'm going to talk about, you know, the research process and picking a floor plan. And then I'm going to talk about the design elements or selections. And then I'm going to talk about construction and then I'm maybe then I'll say, okay, so overall timeline is, you know, X months to, you know, two years or whatever, if you're doing a custom home. So um, you can give those ranges and you can answer those specific questions. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how I think you can expand your post so that you cover a broader topic, but very detailed. And then it's just some like little details around the actual content. I would try to sprinkle in some good photos that maybe break up the section. So maybe in the selection section, you're showing somebody, you know, mm -hmm. in the selection center, you know, choosing some things. And then maybe in construction, you're showing framing or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, adding a video is really powerful. It could be somebody 
just talking in front of the camera explaining this whole process. Mm -hmm. But now if somebody goes to your page and they either read all this content or they sit there and watch a video for three or four minutes, that actually the time people spend on that page is a ranking factor. Mm -hmm. So the longer people are there, the more it benefits your page. Uh, and I always think about too, like all this content that I've just created, do I feel good about putting this out into the world and sharing it on my Facebook page? And like, if you don't feel that good about it, it's probably not good enough, you know? But if you're like, yeah, this is really helpful. This, you know, if somebody came to this page, they would get the answers they're looking for. Then you don't, you know, you don't hesitate when you go promote it and you actually will share it and that will help it rank as well. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of little details to that kind of give you what you're looking for there. Yeah, yeah. So, and you've touched on a couple of really good points there. So, um, first, kind of like the frequency of how often. So, um, you know, you mentioned that quality is Trump's quantity now uh, with yes. Google ranking, but do you have like a recommendation that when you're working with the builders, you say, hey, you know, good rule of thumb is to like, is it the consistency? Like the consistency, does it matter? Like, so if, if I, my goal is going to be to put it out every single week, once a week, or, you know, does it not matter as much as just putting out a great piece of content maybe once a month or? Yeah, I think uh, it's a great question. And I think the answer is a little bit of it. It depends if you're going to write, you know, kind of in that 500 to seven, 800 word length, mm -hmm. I would probably shoot for, you know, one a week. Um, but I think the more in depth the post, the more effort you put into something, um, the better it is. You can actually get away with less, mm -hmm. but you have to put in your promotional time. So promoting that post to your email list on your Facebook page, maybe doing a short video, introing it on Instagram and then mm -hmm. linking back to it, put it on LinkedIn, um, and then boost it on Facebook too. put a little bit of paid budget behind it. Um, and I think if you do that and you put a lot of your effort into promoting the post, then you can get away with less content. Um, so I wouldn't say there's necessarily a magic answer there, um, but I think the longer that post, the more in depth you can, you can get away with less and you can do more promotion. Um, and I, yeah, I've, I've seen case studies of sites where they, you know, maybe write a post every few months, but they literally spend 20 to 30 hours writing the post and it's, the best thing on that topic. So they end up getting a bunch of links, a bunch of shares, and you just get a boatload of traffic, even though it's just one, one post. Mm -hmm. You bring up such a great uh, point about promoting it. So I think it's like the 80, 20 rule, you know, so I feel like most spend 80% of the time writing or whatever, creating that piece of amazing content that's going to attract all those people. And then they spend maybe 20% of the time promoting it. So I always said it should be the opposite, right? I mean, yeah, obviously you want to make sure it's a great content, but spend 20% writing and 80% of the time promoting it because you want to try to get as many eyeballs on it as possible. So do whatever you can to promote that content over and over. And then again, um, it's not a one-time thing, right? You can always reuse it, repost it, like any opportunity you have. So it's something that's, especially if you're creating something that's evergreen, it's going to live on for, you know, as, as long as they don't change the way we build homes, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great point. I mean, you definitely, you know, the 80, 20 and flipping it is a good rule of thumb to follow. Um, and I think too, a lot of times people, it's probably like 99, one, because however much time you spend, creating it you basically go oh great I posted to Facebook click click done and then that's it <laughs> you know and it literally you took no time promoting it um, even if you spent 20 minutes writing the post or an hour or two hours you typically spend like five minutes promoting it and so um, you know your point is a good one you know you want to flip that on its head and if you created something really lengthy then you can break that up and say, hey, have you ever wondered about the selection process? We covered that in this in-depth post here, click. And then maybe the, you know, a week later or two weeks later, you say, hey, have you ever wondered how long it takes to build? We covered that here. And I'm just giving very simple little examples, right. but those are all linking back to that same piece of content that we've been talking about. And so, uh, you know, you continue to reshare that post over and over and over again. Um, with a different framing on it or a different angle in that somebody might be interested in. 
So when you're working with builders, do you recommend that they, um, you know, it's kind of becomes a question of like the community versus the builder? Like, what do you promote? Do you promote the community? Um, and do you have a community specific website? Or do you promote the builder and everything links back to that builder? Because it's almost like, you know, with the community, I mean, obviously you want people to know about this new community that you have and to buy there. But once it's done, it's almost like, well, what happens to all this content now? Like, where is that going? So, um, you know, what do you usually recommend the builders do? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of all the content living on the builder site. Um, for one, it builds up the equity of that site. And so when you create a new community website, that website is starting from ground zero, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of domain authority and equity and all that sort of thing. And so uh, I think from a content perspective, like if a community, you've got that featured on the site and then it shuts down, like there are things that you can do to close off that section of the website. You can add redirects, you know, for if anybody finds those old pages, it'll redirect them to the next best relevant community or back to the homepage so they can, you know, continue their search. Um, but that way you've at least got all your equity built up. And then on your blog, you know, a lot of those topics aren't necessarily specific to the community. Sometimes they can be. Um, and so you're talking about like things like uh, timeline or process that we've been kind of using it as an example, those typically apply across the board. And so you wouldn't necessarily need that, you know, to be covered on five different community websites. It's the same content. And so I think you get into uh, to a tricky spot there. So I'm a huge fan of having all the communities just nested under that main site. People can search a lot easier. Uh, mm -hmm. And that way they get to know those communities as connected to the builder as well. Um, and they know, oh, this, I really like this builder, but this community doesn't work. Oh, they have other communities. Um, and obviously some people just make a decision based on, you know, do they have a floor plan I like and the location I like and the builder doesn't matter as long as they meet a minimum threshold of, you know, reviews or quality that I'm looking for. Um, but I think it can play to your advantage by having everything under one spot because then if something doesn't work for them, they can see what else you have to offer. That's, that's a good point. So then you as a sales rep and marketing person um, can utilize then your Facebook page and other mediums, like especially Pinterest, to help you drive traffic specifically to your community page then. Um, because obviously your job is to let people know about your community. So the problem with, um, you know, I, I mean, again, if you have access to post the blogs specific to your community on your community site great again knowing that you know it's kind of like short-term thing that you know uh, long term long term is not so so i guess evergreen content should be posted to builder side and then community specific that you can attract people looking in that area on the community website um, if you can post there and if you can't like say your builder you know, controls the website and you don't have any um, say in that, then um, beyond, th there are a couple of things that you can do on social media that are better for SEO than uh, some other. So for example, like Facebook and Instagram right now, I mean, we love them, but really as far as SEO goes, they're pretty much worthless for a lot of it, right? Um, so things like, um, you know, posting to Pinterest or YouTube, for example, that's going to give you a lot more visibility, a lot more searchability versus Facebook and Instagram. Am I right with that? Yeah, I think with social media, the way I look at it is like, there's definitely some SEO value there and like stuff getting shared and um, like the social signals that, that Google looks at. Um, I mean, YouTube, definitely there's SEO value there because mm -hmm. that is its own search engine. People do searching there. I kind of look at all these social properties as like little legs or arms from the website. And so when you post something there, you're trying to attract some attention and then drive people back to the site. Okay. So if somebody sees your video on YouTube, like that's great, but ultimately you want them to get them back to the site. Uh, we've been talking about, you know, ranking and driving traffic and that sort of thing. But once you get them there, the main goal is to con convert them and capture them as a lead. So, um, 
that's the way I look at social media is it's a little bit of a branding play. Um, there are some SEO benefits, but really we're trying to, you know, gain some influence and drive some traffic back to the site. Yeah. So speaking of driving traffic back to the site, I mean, obviously if um, your blog post is being found um, by somebody typing in search word, uh, keywords, that's awesome. They go straight to your website. Now, since video is so big these days, um, do you find that it's easier to drive traffic with the video? Um, you know, what's your take on that? Do you feel like, if, you know, posting to YouTube, catching people's attention, you know, I don't know if you've done any kind of a conversion comparisons of YouTube versus just straight um, posting to your website as far as blogs go. Yeah, uh, so are you asking about um, so I guess the blogs or the like video? doing a video? So say we take the blog, right? And sure. so we're going to post it to our website, and then we're also going to do the video version of the blog, and we're going to post gotcha. it to YouTube. Again, goal being to drive them back to our website. So do you see one performing better than the other, or does it again come back to the quality of content and which content people like best? Yeah, yeah, I think. Um, I guess I don't necessarily see it as an either or. Um, I would see it as like, okay, I've got this blog and then I'm gonna create a video version of the blog, but I'm gonna embed that video in the blog and to embed it, one of the easiest ways is to post it to YouTube. So mm -hmm. um, you can take that video and I would say, okay, I've got this video, what are my distribution channels? You know, I've got YouTube, I've got LinkedIn, I've got Facebook. If I chop it up small enough, I've got Instagram or I've got Instagram <laughs> TV. You know, so I can take that video, which is the content, and then depending on, you know, length and all that sort of thing, I can distribute that through all these channels. And so um, I guess with the blog, then I would just take one of those and embed, you know, YouTube being the easiest one and probably the most value for SEO, I would embed that in the blog. So that way, if somebody hits the YouTube channel, they can watch the video, but then there can be a link back to the blog or back to the website and they can get there to the rest of the content. Or if they find the blog through a Google search, then they've got everything there and they don't have to leave your site to go find the video. It's just all right there. I will say that we've started investing in video um, about a little over a year ago and really starting to get into it a lot heavier. And I will say like way more engagement on video. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to grow reach a lot better. And then I would say it drives more traffic and I guess one of the things I did was I just started to look at my own Facebook and Instagram feed and I was like, man, it's all video. <laughs> you know, every, every right. time I scroll, all the stuff that's popping up is video and that's what people like to consume. It's a lot easier to digest. We're lazy, you know, by <laughs> nature, I think, you know, I'd rather just watch a quick video than like read something in a lot of cases. And so, um, yeah, I think the people, the companies are getting on board with video are seeing results and you can you can jump ahead of your competition if you do a good job with video just because it connects you with the audience in a much more powerful way um I've had a lot of people that have said oh you know they'll walk up to me and say oh, oh man i you know keep seeing all your stuff everywhere and i'm going okay well that's awesome well literally all this changes we've done video which allows you to see my face you know right. <laughs> before it was all blogs you know so yeah i guess that's my whole take on video and you know, I just look at it as like, where can I distribute this? Where can I get it in front of more people? Mm -hmm. And it seems like it's not going to change anytime soon. And so I don't know if blogs will at some point, um, you know, kind of be <laughs> the dead medium. But I think right now what you could do is kind of shift it the other way. Maybe uh, think about scripting a video, doing a video, especially if you're great on video, connecting with customers, and then converting that video into a blog post as opposed to doing it the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. And the whole thing about like you said, if, if you're good on video and I will say I was awful on video. I don't know that I'm all that great today, but I will <laughs> say whatever it looks like today, it was way, way worse before. And you just kind of have to start getting some reps in and practicing. Mm -hmm. um, and the funny thing is I'll talk to people and say, Hey, we really need to start doing some video for your marketing. I'll say, well, I, you know, I'm really uncomfortable or I don't, I don't like seeing myself on video. And I said, well, other people see yourself in real life. Like that's what you look like on right. video. You know, we never <laughs> like looking at ourselves, but 
uh, it looks the same. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's silly, but it also is like, it can be super uncomfortable. And so I found like just getting the reps in, even if you have to record like 10 videos that you never put out into the world, mm -hmm. just doing that will help. And you'll look at that 10th video in the first one and it'll be much better. I agree with you. It's, it's definitely super uncomfortable the first time you see yourself on video and it's, you know, cringe worthy, but yeah. the only way to get better is to do it over and over and over again. Absolutely. Um, all right. So basically, whether it's video, whether it's blogging, the point is that we take the customer back to our website. So let's talk very briefly about do's and don'ts of the website. I'm sure you've seen it all. So um, in your opinion, in the world that we're living in now, you know, what are the, the must haves? Maybe like, let's do top three must haves that you're like, if you don't have that, like you're, you know, not even competing. And then let's talk about the top three, maybe biggest mistakes or something that is just like cringe worthy when you see it on, <laughs> on the website. Sure. Uh, let's see. So must haves, I would say uh, you must have photography that represents the quality of work that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you go to, you know, you talk to somebody, I'll talk to somebody on the phone and they'll say, oh yeah, we do like super high end custom homes. And you know, maybe they build like 800 to two, $2 million, you know, is kind of their range. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, I'm looking at your website and it looks like it was built in the nineties and there's a bunch of fuzzy photos. So if somebody sees that and that's their first impression, do they, do you think they're going to say, Oh yeah, I trust this guy to build my $2 million home. So, um, I think that is a, a massive one. It's just mm -hmm. the, the quality of photography, you can't skimp on that. You really need to, because oftentimes that is their first impression, is the website, is the Facebook gallery, is the Pinterest board, you know, whatever it is, wherever you've got those photos, that could be their first impression. Um, I would say the second one that maybe like a must have is just, uh, you must have community information, floor plan information, pricing information. You know, people expect that, they need that information, that's how they're going through their research process. And so if you don't have those things, like people aren't really a big fan of today, like, oh, I went to this website and oh, it didn't have what I needed. I guess I better call them or go like go into the model <laughs> to get that information. Yeah. Like, no, they're just gonna close and go to the next site where they can get that information. So um, there's no use trying to like guard that information or, or hide it or say, well, no, I, I I'm fine giving it to them, but I want to talk to them first. Like, well, you're never going to talk to them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'd put that one as number two, like just being open with your information because they're going to mm -hmm. find it somewhere. They might as well find it from you so you can start building that relationship. Okay, so it's very important for sales reps to make sure that you are updating that information because, you know, if you're as low as is, you know, 600K, but really you're as low as now at 700K, you better have it updated because you're going to have some mad customers when they show up to your model home. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, outdated information. That's another, another good one to add to the list. You know, you can't, can't have that. Um, and then I think the third one is you must have a website that is easy to navigate loads pretty quickly. Um, and then it, it kind of piggybacking, piggybacking off that second point, but it has the information that people want. So I would say, you know, don't overcomplicate the site, make it easy to get to where people want to go. And you can do some things like look at your Google analytics and see what your top traffic pages are mm -hmm. and then see like, is it easy to get to those pages or do they have to go through a few steps and can you streamline that a little bit for your users? So I think making it really easy, uh, would probably be my, my third one is that sometimes it's just like, how do I get to this? You know, and you start clicking around forever and then, you know, people get frustrated, they leave, they move on. So, uh, the easier it is, the better. Love it. Love it. So, okay. So these are the top three tips. So, okay, guys, excellent photography, which we know is a must have, right? Especially in a home building industry. If that's one thing you got to have is excellent photography. So, yes. Um, ease of use and we talked about uh, transparency right so pricing information you got to have it on there if it's not on there again you're gonna get eliminated so all right and then for the three top cringeworthy <laughs> things that you see on the on the website when you uh, working with somebody yeah uh, let's see I guess number one 
I would say actually not having an SSL. And this is a little bit more of a technical cringeworthy one, but it's cringeworthy for me because um, a little over a year ago, Google basically said, hey, having an SSL, making sure your site is secure. If you're not familiar with the terminology, that's the green lock up by your like HTTPS. It means that your website is secure and people, if they fill out a form or information, um, that they know it's protected and safe and your website isn't going to get hacked or anything like that. Um, but that is a ranking uh, factor for Google. And so you immediately like give yourself a lift versus anybody that's not using that. Uh, and maybe I'll bundle in um, mobile friendly. Like if we, if we don't, if it's not mobile friendly today, that is super cringeworthy. Uh, Cause I think we've all seen the stats on how many people are visiting websites on phones and tablets today. Uh, so that would be number one. Number two would be not having uh, top of the funnel lead conversion uh, points installed. And so this is again, me as a marketer, maybe not something um, that everyone would think of like, oh, cringeworthy. I looked at this and it looked awful. But um, when I look at a website and I see that you maybe don't have like downloadable, downloadable brochures, checklists, ebooks, um, guides, things like that where people have to fill out a form in exchange for that information. Mm -hmm. um, it's scary. You're, you're missing probably, um, you know, taking your conversion rate, you know, you'll probably triple it. Um, you'll at least double it if you install these conversion points. And you can oftentimes more than triple it through long-term optimization. Um, and the reason I say that is because going back to this inbound process, people are always in research mode and they're in research mode before they talk to you. And so when they're on your website, they maybe aren't ready for the schedule a tour of a model or the contact us form, but they are ready to download a design guide or a custom home guide or a home buyer's checklist. And so they're willing to trade some information. And then now you've got the ability to follow up with them, start email marketing to them it opens up the window of possibility. Otherwise, if they come, they browse, they get some information, they leave, you're kind of stuck. You're, I mean, maybe they'll find you again, maybe they'll come back, maybe they won't, but you don't have any ability to, to reach out to them. Let uh, me ask you a question about that. So yes. what's your take on pop-up boxes? So like, you know, say I'm on the website and I hovered over a brochure, but I didn't want to click on it. Um, then, you know, I go to leave and the pop-up box pops up saying, are you sure you don't want this brochure? Good question. Pop-ups. Yes. We always hate when they pop up, except when whatever pops up, we actually say, oh yeah, I kind of want that. So uh, personally, I like them as a marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, with the caveat that whatever you've got popping up actually delivers some value to them or adds something that, that you think you have got a pretty good chance of adding value or that they would be interested in. So um, you can test it, you know, but I generally, when we implement those types of things, you see a lift in your conversion rate and it's because sometimes you just kind of need to put that offer right in front of somebody, you know, maybe they didn't see it. It's just sitting there on the side of the page, but mm -hmm. as they go to leave and you offer it and they go, Oh yeah, that actually might be helpful as I'm doing this research. So mm -hmm. I'm maybe not on every well, single page you go, right? Just exactly. Yeah. And you can try like little slide in ones that maybe aren't as intrusive that take up the whole middle of the screen. And, um, but yeah, the data definitely supports them in terms of lead capture and lead conversion. So I'm, I'm pro pop-ups with that caveat that awesome. like you have to add right. value. You heard it here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So we talked about the SSL. And again, if you guys are not familiar with that, when you, next time you go to Google something or next time you type in a website, you'll see it right in the search bar. It's going to say secure or not secure. So if it says not secure, that's a problem. So it definitely needs to be taken care of. Very easy fix and mobile friendly that's something that is expected yes. um, and then make sure you have some goodies that people can download that are uh, worth the the exchange of an email address that they're going to give you and make it something they want so maybe as simple as floor plans i mean you know all the floor plans all the pricing is available but you do have to give out your email address if they're really interested chances are they're going to give it to you so and what's our last cringe worthy thing 
Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Just to jump back to that note you just made on the pricing and the downloading floor plans. Um, we've actually done that with pretty good success. Maybe you have all those, like each floor plan is listed out and you can click on them all and then you can get all the pricing, but then you can download like the complete floor plan guide and pricing guide and people will just give up their information just to get it packaged together. You know, even mm -hmm. though they could get it all just by clicking on everything. So you don't necessarily have to create something new. It can just be compiled and packaged in a different way. So um, hopefully that helps. And then, yeah, the last one, I would say cringeworthy. You go to a website, um, you hit enter, you click on it, and then you wait. <laughs> and then you wait. <laughs> and then you wait. <laughs> And then you see a nice big image and it's slowly filling in and now I can see it. I mean, you've got to have a fast loading site uh, and that's, that would be my last one. And so um, one of the first things you can do is run it through a Google page speed test. Just mm -hmm. go to Google and type in Google page speed. You can run your site through that and it will tell you how quickly it loads and give you a score and it will give you some recommendations on how to improve that. Almost always it's because we've uploaded these really nice high res photos to our website, mm -hmm. um, but we uploaded them at the like 5,000 by 7,000 pixels. So Google has to load that full size and then shrink it to whatever size you've got it on the site. So um, if you resize your images to the exact size that you need them, uh, mm -hmm. that will cut out a lot of that load time. And then, and then it just depends on the site. There will be other recommendations through that tool, but. Uh, that one's definitely cringeworthy because you can lose a lot of people even before right. they have a chance to experience your site. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I love all the information you provided to us today. So I hope you guys are feeling inspired and you have some good ideas as to how you can kick your marketing into gear with some very, very easy strategies using video slash blogs to drive more traffic to your website and make yourself visible and attract the customers, right? Think about the inbound marketing as opposed to going out there, finding the people, let them find you. So a little bit of work, but it definitely pays dividends. And the good news is that it pays dividends over and over and over again. So um, I am so glad my twins did not run, <laughs> bust in on us today. Both <laughs> of them have been sick home from school for two days straight with fever. And uh, no. uh, so uh, they're clearly feeling better now because I can hear them wrestling downstairs. I was like earlier staging the whole house and they're like, what are you doing, mom? <laughs> like, I read this somewhere. It's supposed to help kill the, the germs. So they're okay, whatever. So <laughs> I'm happy that uh, they, they stay put. Um, as, uh, how's your baby doing? I know you're a new father too, right? So everyone's yeah. healthy. Yeah, everyone's good. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a sleeping champ. So we, we love him even more than we would have. Uh, yes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's sleeping, he's that's, yeah. Very nice. Okay. I'm glad, I'm glad he's sleeping for you. Well, Spence, thanks so much for being on the show today. And before you head out, um, if people wanted to connect with you to learn more about your company, what you do, um, tell us where we can find more information. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. I mean, easiest way is just our website, builderfunnel.com. Um, there's plenty of ways to engage with us there. I mean, obviously, if you want to talk about marketing, happy to start a conversation, but we have tons of this type of material, you know, in the form of video content, downloads, you'll see everything we talked about kind of in practice on our website. So uh, yeah, that's the easiest place to go is just builderfunnel.com and you, you know, you can find us that way. Great. And if you guys are looking for more uh, similar content, uh, Spence does have his own podcast as well. What's the podcast? Yeah. Uh, so it's called Builder Funnel Radio. And yeah, again, you can just Google that or search it in your, you know, iTunes or SoundCloud or whatever you like to listen to your podcasts on. Awesome. And I'll make sure to link all of that in the show notes. So thank you, Spence. I appreciate your time and I will catch you next time. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Bye. See ya.